Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I'm doing a series of webinars with really knowledgeable horse people to bring you educational information that you may not be able to find in your normal day to day lives. A lot of my speakers are people that are really, really uh, bright and and innovative, but they tend to wind up in their own little world like Dr. Robert Bowker, and we have to kind of pull him out of the closet to get him to talk to us. But today my guest is Janet Jones, and I'm so excited to have her today because she has written this fabulous book, if you haven't heard about it, and I don't know if, there we go, Horse Brain, Human Brain. And it so fits in with the other webinars we've been doing with Dr. Stephen Peters and Dr. Bowker. And so I, I'm so excited to bring you this webinar today so that we can learn more about how the horse and human brain can work together for a positive outcome. So welcome, Janet. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me, Wendy. I'm really happy to be here. So Janet, tell us a little bit about your background. Like how, how did you wind up becoming a, uh, you know, a neuroscientist? And, and was, I'm so interested in how you got here. Um, well, I, I'm a quirky person, I guess, because it's kind of an unusual combination to have. Um, but um, I, uh, I grew up in a very horsey location and I rode from a very early age. And um, so I was uh, very much immersed in horses throughout my childhood and adolescence. And um, at one point, I, uh, like we all do, um, had an accident with a horse and got a brain injury. Oh, wow. And um, so my intent before that was just to uh, become a horse trainer and continue on in the work that I had already been doing for, for many years. And um, I, uh, I, had a, I had a brain injury in an accident on a horse and it left me with transient amnesia, which is um, a, a loss of memory that comes and goes. And so basically um, on the day that I had this accident, uh, I lost consciousness uh, apparently briefly. And the next thing that I knew after this fall uh, was that I was sitting around a table with a group of people who I knew. Um, and it was in the late afternoon and my fall had happened at about six o'clock in the morning. And um, I looked around the table and I said something very odd, like, what's going on here? Yeah. And everyone looked over at me and they said, well, you know, nothing. We've, we've been riding all day. We've, we've been doing our usual thing. What do you mean? And um, so I explained that I didn't really have any memory of what had happened that day. And they informed me that, um, did I remember that I fell? And I did remember that. And they said, well, you know, you, you got up and you finished riding that horse and you went on and you rode your usual eight more horses that day and you gave lessons and you've been doing everything just like you always normally do. Well, I had absolutely no awareness of having done anything at all. And so this experience completely fascinated me and I wanted to know what happened. I wanted to know what had happened inside my brain that it could allow me to continue functioning at that degree and yet have absolutely no awareness that I was functioning. And you're so lucky you didn't have a brain bleed or something, you know, that- Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> it's hard. You know, back then it was kind of hard to know what the heck was going on inside. Yeah. We didn't have images or anything. And um, so this, this transient form of amnesia continued to occur for about two years. And I would lose awareness of what I was doing from, you know, brief, uh, times, maybe two hours at a time, and sometimes it lasted for up to two days. And I was, I, I think that if I had been able to go out and read a book that told me why that had happened and what was going on in my brain, I probably would have been satisfied with that right then. I would have put the book down and said, great, I know what's going on now. Now let's get back to my primary goal in life. But Back at that time, no one really knew what was going on or what caused that. And so this began a lifelong fascination with the human brain. And I ended up uh, going to college and then graduate school and getting a PhD 
uh, from UCLA in brain science. And that is so time, cool. <laughs> I, I had this other track of, of you know, horses. And it took me decades, Wendy. I'm rather ashamed to admit how long it took me to, to, to bring the two together. But um, for a long, long period of time, I just pursued these two interests completely independently. And um, I taught neuroscience for many years and I rode horses on the side. And uh, it wasn't until about, uh, I guess, 2010 or maybe 2008, somewhere around in there, where I began thinking about how these two things might come together um, more. And as soon as I had that idea, and I, I'm going to get to that in a few minutes too today, um, as soon as I had that idea, I, I really um, ran with it. I could see that, that this was something that was going to be helpful. Yeah, you know, it's so, it's so fascinating. First of all, I want to just say that, you know, you took a situation and you made it your life career. And that is so amazing because so many people look at that and go, oh, you know, uh, I'm now stuck with this uh, temporary amnesia and oh, poor me. But I'm, that's so cool that you have just gotten fascinated and investigated into it. I just think that's awesome. Um, and don't worry about being late to the party. I think we're all starting, you know, there's this whole idea that horses, we need to look at the horse's brain and address that. And so you're the perfect person because you've got all this understanding of the human brain. So I think it's fantastic. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's one of those really strange things where you've got two really um, unrelatable things in your life that later you realize are very, very relatable. And that if you put them together, you might be able to help a lot of people and a lot of horses. And, and that's why I do this. I, I really want to, uh, I want to help those horses and, and I want to help the, those of us who work with them. So that, That's fantastic. All right. Well, so what, what an amazing career. And I know you've written a lot of different disciplines and are you still teaching at um, neuroscience, brain science? No, I'm not. I retired from that so that I could open a small training business of my own. Um, I had worked very early on for a very large barn. We had uh, anywhere between 60 and 80 horses uh, at any given time. And so I trained there and lived there for many years. And then um, and then I kind of went, you know, turned my life more over to neuroscience and taught for 23 years in that area and then came back and opened a small training business of my own. So great. That's yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. So, so I think you have a presentation for us. I do. And um, I'm going to save time for questions at the end. But in addition, I hope that you'll just um, jump in with any questions that you see coming in on the chat room if, if they're, you know, if they if they make more sense at the time when I'm talking about them. Yep. So, awesome. so anybody watching, if you do have a question, put it in the chat or the Q&A, and then I'll ask it where I think it's appropriate or where there's a pause. And then, we'll, of course, we'll take questions at the end. Great. All right. That sounds really good. Well, so um, as I was saying a minute ago, um, I opened a small horse training business of my own. Um, and, and, this, and this happened after I had uh, been steeped in human brains and teaching neuroscience for, for many, many years. And I noticed that my students were complaining about problems that my horses or that their horses were having um, that really weren't problems in my mind. They were indications of the animal's natural way of perceiving and interpreting the world. And the problem wasn't really the horse. Um, and it wasn't really the rider either. It was the mismatch between their brains. So horses perceive and understand the world in one way. And humans do that in a very, very different way. And I think that we all have vastly underestimated the difference between the equine brain and the human brain. And I think most people who work with horses really do not understand just how generous they are being uh, in, in their attempts to figure out what we want and, and what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to get them to do. 
So once this idea occurred to me about you know, so-called problems, um, I started to find it very frequently. And I found that even the very top riders, drivers, uh, and trainers um, were often working against the horse's brain without realizing it. Mm -hmm. And I wondered at that time, what would happen if we consciously started to work with the horse's brain? It seemed to me that surely that would be more effective. Um, it would certainly be more generous toward the horse. Um, and I wasn't sure what other advantages might or might not come about with it. I wasn't even sure if it would work or whether it could be done. But that was the initial thought that inspired me to begin studying equine brains. And um, I added, of course, my own knowledge of human brains to that mix. And I began experimenting with my own horses and my clients um, to see what would happen if the horse's brain was taken into greater account. So I have to thank many years worth of students and training clients who allowed me to experiment with them and their horses to try to figure out how exactly can we um, improve the communication between the two brains. So um, it's, it's been really interesting kind of to see what has happened with that. And um, I'm just gonna share my screen here with everybody so that uh, you can, so that I can show you a few things that I think will help. Okay, can you see the, this title page? Yep. Good. All right, things are going well, if you can see the title <laughs> page. I like that. <laughs> so, um, so this book came about um, after I had spent quite a bit of time thinking about these ideas and I tested them for quite a period of time uh, with articles in Equus magazine. And um, uh, my editor at Equus was fantastic, Lori Prince. She does a fantastic job. And she did a really good job of um, allowing me to explore these different ideas in different ways. And I got tons of feedback from my readers of those articles. And so those that feedback really helped me also to realize that, um, that that people out in the world, horse people, were very interested in this topic and um, that, that I should continue with it and see maybe what I could come up with. So um, I'm going to back up on that for just a moment. Um, <clears throat> one thing that's important to recognize about brain-based horsemanship is that it's relevant to all equestrian disciplines. It doesn't matter a bit whether we specialize in reining, dressage, driving, uh, draft pulls, trail jumping, whatever. There are so many different disciplines nowadays. Uh, but what's important in brain-based horsemanship is simply that every horse has an equine brain and every handler has a human brain. And both brains have to be considered in order to communicate with each other. Sometimes I talk to people who have no horse background at all, and so I have to try to explain to them or show them what kind of communication I'm talking about. But um, I think your audience are, are a group of horse people who know this very well. Um, any of us who watch horse and human teams work together knows that some very powerful communication is going on. and. Um, Sometimes this communication works very well. So we have situations where, for example, cutting um, is a discipline that, that uh, um, shows this very well. All of our disciplines show this really well. Um, we have dressage in which we have horses crossing their legs to degrees that um, would be very difficult for us as humans to do while we're trotting or cantering sideways. Um, I don't know how often you all canter, but I canter sometimes. Yes. <laughs> and um, 
we have horses who do endurance riding over incredibly rough uh, terrain and um, and yet look at this horse with his ears up and he's eager and motivated and ready to go. And you know that there's a whole lot of horse and human communication going on there. This is one of my favorite photographs. Kathy Kusner yeah. was one of my heroes when I was a girl. And uh, this is roughly a seven foot wall. Uh, the horse's name was Untouchable. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> remember Untouchable? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, some, so as I say, sometimes this communication works really well. Um, and then sometimes it doesn't. So the first rule of horse sports, in my opinion, is that your equipment is alive. And there, I don't think, is any other sport in which we have that situation. The tennis racket is not alive. The skis are not alive. The race car is not alive. But our equipment is alive and it's thinking. You know, so I think sled, sledding with dogs is probably the only other. Yes. That's a really good example. Dog sledding. I had not thought of that. But that's a very good example. So, you know, this is a, a, a relatively unusual kind of sport in the sense that the equipment has a mind of its own and is to some extent unpredictable. Uh, because of that unpredictability, every now and then we have failures in horse and human communication. Um, and sometimes they're uh, just embarrassing like that first one was. Sometimes they're painful, which it appears to me that this one is going to be because I really don't like the way her hand is gonna be the first thing to hit the ground there. <laughs> and her head second, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I've done that before and it did not go well for my hand. So I'm thinking that it probably won't go well for hers. And then we have to admit that some of these situations, let me get that. Um, whoops, sorry. It's okay. Some of these situations uh, of poor communication are downright dangerous. Yeah. And um, so we, we really need to take into account the fact that, um, that it's important for us to figure out as much as we can about um, the horses that we ride and to understand their brains as well as we can. When I first began thinking about all of this, I, I studied equine brains because I felt that that was the area that I needed to know the most about, which was true in my sense because I'm already a human brain scientist. But horse brains alone are not enough to explain what I do. Um, my work is about the interaction between the two types of brains. And that's where things went wrong in those last couple of pictures. Um, that's why my book is not just called Horse Brain. <laughs> it's called Horse Brain, Human Brain for a very specific reason. And that's because both sides have to be taken into account. Now, one thing that's really interesting about this is that um, when you start thinking about it, you realize horses have prey brains. Their brains evolved at a time when they were actively prey animals. And it was really important for them and for their brains to behave in a specific way so that they did not get eaten by predators for dinner. Um, humans, at the time we were evolving, developed predator brains. Prey animals and predator animals are very, very different. And their brains, the, the brains that we still have today, um, are extremely different. So somehow, we with our horses are doing remarkable daily work. All of us are doing remarkably daily work because we are requiring prey brains and predator brains to interact mutually at all times. Often that literally involves direct communication back and forth uh, between equine neurons and human 
neurons. And I mean that at a completely literal level. So this is one of the areas that my book goes into in great detail. Um, this direct neural link is extremely rare in the world of cross-species communication, but it's fairly common in equestrian disciplines. And I think that um, we just kind of haven't, haven't recognized that quite yet. I mean, in addition, this interaction is very important because everything that we learn about horse brains is filtered through <laughs> our human brains, right? And vice versa. So anything a horse learns about us is filtered through an equine brain. That means that we have to have a two-way street of communication, even at the level of individual neurons. We cannot communicate as a team through just one type of brain. So there's been um, a kind of assumption in the past, and some people have taken it to greater levels than others. But I think all of us have to some degree um, assumed that the human brain will simply dictate action to the horse brain, will simply tell the horse what to do. It's just not that simple. And it turns out that we get much different results uh, when we do this differently and take into account both brains. So if I can get back over here to my arrows, there we go. We go. Um, there's some advantages of brain-based horsemanship that, <clears throat> that I've discovered uh, over these years of kind of developing this idea. And, um, I find that when we recognize how radically different a horse's brain is from our brains, then we can begin to really work with them, at least to a certain degree. And I think any degree helps the horse. And I think it ends up um, helping us with all of these different advantages. So one of the things that became obvious to me right away is that if you understand the differences between brains, you can ride and handle and drive horses much more safely than you can if you're just thinking about your own brain and thinking about dictating action to an extremely large and an agile, um, unpredictable animal. And the reason I think for this increased safety is mostly that when we understand how a horse perceives the world and interprets the world, then we can anticipate where some of problems are going to occur. We can predict ahead of time what's going to go potentially wrong and watch out for it. Brain-based horsemanship allows us also to train more effectively. So um, there are many chapters in my book on learning uh, equine learning and the differences between equine learning and human learning. And um, those allow us to uh, develop ways of teaching horses what we want, rather than just expecting them to figure it out. We can improve performance by doing that, and we can improve it in all equine disciplines. Not only riding or driving disciplines, but this work is it has been very, very relevant for farriers, veterinarians, people throughout the horse world. Um, I teach, I co-teach a required course at the veterinary school uh, at Colorado State University now. Um, and we have found that this has been extremely helpful in uh, improving veterinary performance and in allowing veterinarians to work more safely around horses. So I think there are a lot of different, uh, a wide variety of areas of the horse industry that we might not always uh, think about immediately. Absolutely, we can protect our animals' comfort and increase their welfare by learning something about how their brains operate. Uh, we can encourage mutual trust. I find this very frequently that um, as soon as I begin to work with a horse or a student, 
um, in terms of teaching them about the differences between their brains and working with the horse according to what his brain can manage. Um, that the bond of trust becomes much, much stronger between the horse and the human. And I've even had situations, and I haven't tested this out completely, but so it's just a, you know, it's just an observation at this point. Believe me, I'm I'm testing it carefully right now. Um, but I, I have had the observation that I think that once we begin this work, horses actually test our trust in various ways. And I think that they do more of that as soon as they realize that there's a potential for a bond of trust there. Um, now there has been trust between horses and humans for thousands of years, long before I came along. But I do think that uh, by teaching some of this more explicitly, I think there I think I'm going to be able to find some things of interest about this uh, bond of trust and the way that horses look at that. We can develop brain-to-brain -brain communication between species with this, and I mean that very, very literally. And right now I'm working with a number of um, scientific uh, neuroscience associations and organizations um, to explain to them, most of them are not horse people, because I work in two totally different <laughs> worlds. Um, and so uh, I, I am working right now with a number of um, animal behavior scientists in terms of describing to them some of the things that horses and humans do together that no other animal pairs are doing at this time. And so in general, I think we create stronger horse and human teams um, by considering what's going on with the, with the. Can, can you just give us an example of what you mean by that they test our trust? Yeah. Um, again, this is just a really general observation that I haven't had time to work through completely yet. But I notice that um, after I've worked with a horse for um, three or four months in a different way than that horse was accustomed to being worked with before. Let's suppose that this is a horse who was accustomed to simply being kind of told what to do before. And the idea was simply, you figure it out. I'm not really gonna teach you to um, accept the horse vacuum or the ear clippers. You're just, you know, you're, you're gonna get used to it over time and you figure it out. Whereas in my technique, I actively teach those kinds of things over a long period of time, very, very gradually, before I expect the horse to stand still for something like a vacuum or a clippers or you know anything that is not a natural part of the horse world. And let's face it, most of what we have in our human world is not a natural part of the horse world. Um, and so what I find is that as I begin to work with these horses, they test me in, in very small ways to see what happens if I do this. If she turns on the vacuum cleaner and I take one step back, what happens? And I'm speaking you know, metaphorically from the horse's point of view here. If, if she moves those clippers up a little bit closer to my face, and I move my face away, what happens? What happens if I move my face an inch toward her? These are things that are, are partly based on, on a very long and gradual technique of teaching horses, but I think that they also are going to come to show a greater bond of trust in time. It's just something I need to work out more. So, we'll so, so I think if I understand what you're saying, that the horse is kind of uh, waiting to see if we're going to insist or give him a moment to pro to. And, and the example I have for me is I have a little horse I'm working with and he used to not be able to put the halter on easily, but now I hold it out and I wait for him to decide to put his head in. I don't just stuff it on his head, but mm -hmm. there sometimes is a hesitation when he's like, hmm, okay. And so, 
that's like a test of trust. Are you going to stuff it on my head or are you going to give me the moment to make the decision? I think so. I think that is a good example. And so there's lots of, they're very small things that yeah. I think many of us in the past have simply ignored or not thought about. And every now and then I get, uh, I have these wonderful conversations with readers and people who are familiar with my work. And every now and then somebody says, well, yeah, that would work, but usually I just stick it on there. I don't have time for all this. And so I have to explain to them, well, I understand what you mean that we don't all have time, for example, to wait for your horse to decide whether he wants to be haltered or not. But if we take the time early on in those very small little uh, requests, we gain so much time in the long run where a year from there, we have a horse that is much more willing to, um, to readily go ahead and try something that is unusual that you might not have tried before. So um, you, you just asked me the perfect question with what's an example of this. So what I've just done is given all of you a very general description of my work, but I want to look at some examples. And um, there are hundreds of them. I just, you know, we have a limited period of time. And so um, I just wanted to kind of go through a few examples that I think I probably can explain um, in relatively short period of time, but that will give everyone a sense of what I'm talking about with this mutual horse brain and human brain interaction that's going back and forth or needs to go back and forth at all times. So we need to remember this is a, an interaction between prey brain and a predator brain. Very, very unusual because of course most prey brains, no, not most, all prey brains are designed and engineered and they have evolved to avoid predators, to run away from predators, not to allow predators to be near them or to touch them or heaven forbid to ride them. So it's something that um, we don't think about, I think, often enough. Okay, so vision is one of the areas where a lot of these ideas first occurred to me. And I think vision is an area where it's fairly easy for us humans to um, to imagine or understand the differences that occur in a, a horse's brain as opposed to a human brain. Um, when we ride or drive or handle animals in any way, veterinary work, farrier work, grooming, tacking up, all that, we generally assume that animals see the same way we do. This is absolutely not true in the case of the horse and the human. The first big difference, and there are many differences, more than the five that I've listed here, but the first big, big difference in vision is that vision is primary for humans. It is our best sense, and it is the sense that we rely on more than any other sense. So, one third of the human brain is devoted to vision. There is no other sense in humans that has that much brain real estate. That is not true for horses at all. In the horse's brain, smell is the most important thing. Vision definitely is low in priority. It's not even, I say here, secondary, but it's not even really secondary. It's tertiary or on down the list someplace. Um, so, so we think when we're riding along that the horse is seeing what we're seeing and that what the horse sees is extremely important to the horse, much more so than what the horse might smell or hear or feel. And um, that's simply not true. If we think a little bit about how the horse does see the world, the first obvious difference that comes up is the fact that our eyes point to the front 
of our bodies. And so when we look out at the world, we are primarily seeing the frontal view. We are capable of focusing very, very clearly on um, things that are out in front of us, even if they're a long distance away. And our peripheral vision only goes out about that far, unless we move our eyes or turn our heads. So we have about a 90 degree angle of uh, visible world when our faces are pointing straight ahead. But of course, we all know the horse's eyes are set over here. So the frontal view for the horse is not particularly good and it's not particularly um, as helpful as you might think. And the horse does, however, have tremendous peripheral vision. So the things that the horses, that horses are seeing out in this area and back here behind them are clear and obvious. And so the horse has a range of vision that extends about 340 degrees. There's a small area right in the middle that's not too good, right directly in the front that's not great. And then there's all this vision all the way around to the side, all the way around to the back. And then there's a little strip right behind the horse's hindquarters and just off to each side of his hips um, that the horse cannot see without moving. Right. Well, that creates all kinds of uh, different situations. So for one thing, we complain all the time at horses who are um, shying at things that aren't there. There's nothing there, we say, because we're annoyed because it's, you know, it doesn't feel too good to have your horse leap sideways all of a sudden. There's nothing there. Well, how would we know? <laughs> yeah. We can't see back there. So, you know, the horse has another couple of hundred plus more degrees of vision to see than what we have. So something like that is really, it becomes really critical when you start thinking, if next time you get on a horse and you walk down a trail or you walk along the long side of the arena or wherever you walk, just think about the difference just in the range of vision that the horse has as opposed to what you have. And that in itself is um, something that has to be taken into account. A third item with respect to vision has to do with the fact that human vision at the level of the eye and at the level of the brain is <clears throat> made for detailed focus. Um, so we can focus on things that are very close to our bodies because we have to use our hands to manipulate objects and we have to be able to see those objects right here in our hands. But we, are, we are also capable of looking way out into the distance and focusing in great detail on objects. So humans have much better acuity um, and much better ability to look at detail than horses do. Horses do not see detail all that well. But on the other hand, we're not terrific at sensing motion, especially peripheral motion out in here. <clears throat> horses visual cells, uh, both in their eye and in their the visual cortex of the equine brain, can actually sense motion that is too fast for human cells to detect. So even if you and I are looking directly at something that is moving very quickly, it could be moving too quickly for us to see. Our human brain simply would not be able to process the speed of that movement and we would not know that it had occurred. But a horse's brain can process that high speed motion. So once again, when we say nothing's there, probably something is, and it could well have been a high speed motion that caused a horse to bolt that we were not physically capable of seeing because our brains don't have the right cells to detect it. 
Um, dark adaptation turns out, and, and uh, light adapt adaptation too, turns out to be another big issue in vision that we often don't think about in terms of horse and human brains. So <clears throat> by dark adaptation, I'm referring to that um, formerly known process that we all used to experience when we got to go to movie theaters. And you'd sit inside a movie theater and watch a movie for two hours in the dark. And then you'd get up and if it was a day, you know, a matinee or something like that, you'd go outside and shield your eyes because it's so bright out there and so difficult to see. And then the same thing happens when we come inside the movie theater from outside at first. You've been outside all day, you come inside the movie theater where it's very dark and if the movie has already started, you know how sometimes we have to just stand there for a few minutes because we can't see a thing. It's like being dropped inside of an ink bottle or something. Um, it turns out that human eyes adapt to the dark fully in about 25 minutes. Um, we adapt somewhat in the first five or 10 minutes, but not completely. And there's a lot that we cannot see during that time. Horses' eyes do not adapt to the dark until 45 minutes have gone by. So we show horses all the time in uh, indoor arenas that are not very well lit. We bring them into shady barns in the daytime, we don't turn the lights on. We don't need to because we, our eyes, can adapt to that much more quickly than the horses. And so we have to really remember that horses' eyes cannot adapt that quickly. They're simply physically unable to yeah. do that. And uh, when we ask a horse to warm up over jumps outside in a very bright, uh, outdoor arena and then march right over to a poorly lit indoor arena and jump a course and we wonder why the horse refuses at the first fence or why the horse doesn't jump as well in there. One of the reasons for that is that the horse cannot possibly see very well um, without adequate time for their eyes to adapt. Uh, Color is the other example that I wanted to use. Um, horses do not see color in anything like the way that we see color. Um, all colors for horses are washed out, kind of pale and faded. Um, horses cannot see the distinction between red and green. And um, so anything that is red against a green background, like a red jacket on a green grass lawn, or anything that is green on a red background, the horse is not going to be able to make out the color difference. If it's something that moves, of course, the horse will be able to identify it from the movement. Or if it's something that speaks, the horse will be able to identify it. Um, but if we're just looking at color, uh, red and green are completely indistinguishable to horses. And so we have an interesting example here of how this work can be applied. Um, a few years ago, I wrote an article on this issue of color uh, in uh, Horse Magazine, and it was shared uh, and picked up actually by CNN News uh, because it turned out that the um, British Racing Authority in the United Kingdom uses red or orange um, poles to signify the location of steeplechase hurdles on race courses. This is a very dangerous sport. I mean, all horses, all horse sports are dangerous, but if you've ever seen, um, you know, 20 horses at high speed leaping over the same jump at the same time, um, and some of the accidents that happen with that, you know that this is very dangerous. Well, 
The British Racing Authority has now decided to change the color of all of their steeplechase um, hurdles from the orange poles or reddish poles to white poles. Because from this work that I'm talking about, the brain-based horsemanship work, they discovered and they tested this once they had read the article and thought about it a little bit. And they discovered that the number of accidents and fatalities was increasing tremendously because they were using orange poles that cannot be seen against a green background. So when a horse, gallops up at super high speed, or even if he walked up to it, to a jump like this, he would not be able to see those two orange lines at all. It would all look the same color to him. And so I'm, that's an example that I really like, of course, because it's something that's gonna save horses' lives. It's something that probably will save some jockeys' lives and it will save a lot of injuries. And it's very easy to do a jockey can see a white pole just as well as an orange or red pole. So why not use a pole that both the jockey and the horse can actually see? So the United Kingdom is in the process of changing all of those right now. Wow, that's fascinating. It is. It's really a, a, a pretty cool kind of thing that is happening with that. And um, so I want to go back to this other slide. Okay. So the other example that I want to talk to you about is what is called categorical perception. And I try in my work not to use a whole lot of big, you know, multi-syllabic kinds of uh, <laughs> phrases like this, but this is the term for a brain process that humans have. And basically what happens here is that, um, our brains automatically organize the sights and sounds of the outside world. They, it, it's a process that groups a number of instances together into a larger category. So when we see a log, we know it's a member of the group of all logs. It's a log similar to other logs. And each one can be treated the same. If I'm gonna step over this log, I could just as well use the same behavior and step over some other log in another location or maybe a log that looked a little bit different. So we're not fooled when we see a log from a different angle or maybe in an unusual context. And this automatic process is so ingrained in humans that we don't even know what life is like without it. So we can't even imagine that a log lying down might be a different object than a log leaning against a tree. But that's only because we have this fully automatic process inside our brains. Our brains create these categories whether we want them to or not. And it's very difficult to override categorical perception so that you can even think about this in a different way. The interesting thing here is that horse brains do not have automatic categorical perception. A horse brain will treat every item as a new and different instance. And so for a prey animal, any new item is potentially dangerous. It could eat you. So a horse might be fully accustomed to a log that's lying on the ground in a certain place. Maybe it's on a trail and you ride right past that log every day. And there it is. The horse knows that it's there and it's just not a big deal. Horse doesn't even notice the log. Now, move that log or turn it so that the horse gets a different view. Maybe all of a sudden he's looking at the end of the log instead of the side of the log. And it now has become the equivalent of an entirely new object, which could be potentially dangerous and probably should be bolted away from in case it's potentially dangerous. So 
we humans, as we ride up to this, whatever this is, I'm using log as an example, but it could be anything. We do not expect our horses to be worried about the same old log that happens to be in a new location. But that's only because we have an automatic process inside our brains that horses don't have. And if we didn't have that process, we would recognize um, this problem a lot. We would be a lot more sympathetic, I think, to the horse if that was the case. Well, I think the classic term is, you should know better. I mean, there how are, there are so you? Many, Absolutely, there are so many things that we say to our horses all the time. You know better than that. What are you looking at? There's nothing there. Um, you've seen that a million times. times. Right. <laughs> we all say that stuff. And I have to confess, I say it too. Yeah. In a moment when a horse shies really hard, you know, that comes right out of my mouth automatically too. But then I remember, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. He, he, he doesn't have that handy little process inside his mind that I have inside of mine. So you can see that categorical perception is really the basis for a lot of shying that happens uh, in the world. And when we say all those words, you've seen that before, or stop playing games with me, what's the matter with you? Um, we have to remember, yeah, the horse might have seen that item before, but not from that angle, not in that context. And to their brains, as soon as you change the angle or the context, it is a new object. Now, horses can be taught to overcome that. They can learn to overcome that, but they have to be taught and they have to learn. And it takes time to teach the horse that and specific effort to teach the horse that. So it's not an automatic thing the way it is for humans. We don't have to be taught that different objects um, are not are, are part of the same category. Our brains already teach us that automatically. We know that a horse has to be taught. So if you know that your brain categorizes objects automatically and you know that your horse's brain doesn't do that, you can better anticipate which things are going to frighten him. And then you can do a lot better job of um, staying on for one thing and uh, understanding your horse for another. So it's, it's uh, is it fair to say that it is repeated experience that helps the horse understand when seeing things from different angles? And repeated experience is helpful, but a horse needs to be taught. So it's not just a matter of riding the horse past all this stuff again and again and again. It's a matter of teaching the horse that they can trust the rider, that they can, when they see something that seems to be new, that they can look to their rider for guidance as to how to manage this situation. Um, it's also a matter of teaching the horse to wait just five seconds before they bolt which is, or shy, which is, of course, very hard to teach a prey brain to do because it's not designed to wait. It's the, you, if you wait, you get eaten. So um, the, it, it's, it's a, shying is a very interesting and difficult um, problem to really manage in a lot of horses. And, um, and as we all know, some horses shy and startle a lot more easier. I'm sorry, a lot easier than others do, not a lot more easier. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, it's the, so these are some quick and fairly easy examples of the kind of work that I do and the reason that it's so important not just to know about a um, horse's brain, but also to know how the human brain is different and how the two work together. Uh, I love this picture right here. Um, I do not, this woman's name is um, Nikki and I do not know her. I have not met her, but she is a reader of the book and she put this picture on Instagram 
um, a couple of months ago, and I just think it's a wonderful picture. The horse looks so interested in the book. I wonder if she has a carrot or something down there. <laughs> you see her hands. I don't think she does actually. No, she probably doesn't. So yeah. anyway, it's kind of a it's kind of a fun fun thing. It's a great um, picture. Yeah. So that's kind of what I do. That's what the book is about. Um, this book uh, takes, I've been talking about vision. Um, I think there are two chapters on vision in this book. And um, there's one chapter that talks about categorical perception in addition to other automatic uh, brain processes like that. Some humans, some equine, none, both. Um, and uh, and then uh, there are um, 19 other chapters in the book, and they go into all of the different um, sensory perceptions. So hearing, smell, taste, touch, um, all of those different kinds of things. And there are five, four or five chapters on various aspects of learning and uh, two chapters on attention in horses, uh, one on emotion in horses, and one on forethought or planning um, strategy, that kind of thing. And each one of them looks at this from an anatomical point of view, physiological point of view, and a very practical point of view. Because my work is not just about science by itself. My work is very applied. Um, everything that I talk about in this book, I have done on the back of multiple horses. And so um, I, I, I think that experience has really helped me to understand this. Um, and I think also it helps me to explain it to people who need to know it, you know, because it's their daily work, not just because it um, happens to be interesting to them. So <clears throat> let me get out of this. Um, for P and I know I am saving time for questions. I can see that there have been a lot of questions coming in. Um, this is my website, uh, janet-jones.com. So if there's anybody out there who would like to know more, please feel free to go hunt around in there, you know, surf around and see what you can find. And there's a link to my Facebook page there also. Um, and now I just want to stop the share so that I can interact a little bit better with all of you. And um, so what do we have for questions? Um, we have one question. So do horses have a sense of recognition of a particular person? Absolutely. Horses have strong recognition skills and they can recognize a, uh, an individual person, um, not only someone who they see on a regular basis, horses can recognize people that they have not seen for years and who they do not always have very much experience with. So they recognize our voices, they recognize our um, facial features, they recognize our clothing, they recognize the biomechanics of the way that we walk and move. Um, they're very, very good at that, yes. Uh, someone's asking if their sense of smell is as strong as a dog. Yes, there's a, a long, part of a chapter, I have a chapter on smell in my book, and it was one of the most fascinating to me, because here's an area where we have severely underestimated the horse. Um, when it comes to brain machinery, horses have this, an equivalent amount of um, cells for scent, they have an olfactory nerve that is huge that carries scent into their brains. They have not one but two sensory organs for smell. They have a nose, of course, but they also have what's called a vomeronasal organ that is located up inside the nose. And all of this uh, machinery um, allows horses to have very, very strong senses of smell. Um, I think that much of the um, behavior of a horse is determined by what it can smell. Humans, of course, have lousy 
yeah. with smell. One of the reasons for that, interestingly, is because vision was so important to humans that the that our brains evolved to allow more cortical space for vision. And in order to do that, it had to push out and get rid of cells that would have otherwise been used for smell. So can a horse smell as well as a dog can? Yes. Can a horse smell as well as a bloodhound can? Almost certainly, yes. Wow. Yeah. Now there's more research that we need to do comparing the horses to bloodhounds particularly, but I feel really confident that we're going to find that, um, that horses can smell as well as bloodhounds can. Wow, that, that's fascinating. Um, and I know that they're starting to use horses more as scent animals for uh, certain situations. Um, horses do cast scent. I mean, you know, they will put their noses down and follow a scent trail if they need to. And they have a scent clan in their frog. So they're yes. actually leaving their scent around as they walk around too. Yes, so yes. yes, absolutely. Right. Um, someone's just commenting how she wore a hood the other day and her horse didn't recognize her until she spoke to it. And then the yes. horse was like, oh, that's you. Right, um, yes, that's, that's very true. And I'm seeing a lot of questions here um, about should we not wear scents or should we use essential oils with horses? Um, the answers to those are, you need to know the effect of those scents and oils because yes, your horse is going to pick them up from a distance away much sooner than you would ever pick it up. And um, there are certain uh, oils that sometimes um, are used, um, I, I know of one, I can't think of the name of it right now, but um, some of the veterinarians that I work with um, in the, at the veterinary school uh, where I've been co-teaching um, uh, talk about the um, certain scents that can be used for calming horses. And I have used those a couple of times and I'll be the first person to say, I am not a big fan of calming supplements and all that kind of thing, because in my own experience, they have not worked. Um, but I have to say that some of the veterinary developed pharmaceutical um, scents for calming do tend to have an effect. It's a small effect, but sometimes when you're dealing with a particular horse, a small effect is much appreciated. <laughs> yes, really. Um, let's see. Oh, well, somebody's saying they're convinced that the horse knows the sound of their car. I'm sure of it. My cats do. <laughs> um, horses do recognize the sound of the car, not only just any car, they recognize the sound of particular cars. So yes, they can do that. And they Here's do the do it on a regular basis. Um, this is an interesting question is why does touching the chestnut invariably cause the horse to lift or lighten the leg? In my experience, that has not been invariable. Um, I have had horses who um, you could touch the chestnut all day long and they're not gonna lift any weight off of that leg. Um, so I don't really, I, I actually don't know the answer to that. Like in, if, if this is something that, um, that very many horses do. I don't know why that that is the case. I mean, it might have to do with the fact that the chestnut in long ago in evolution used to be uh, an actual toe on the horse's foot um, before they developed hooves. And it is possible that there is some kind of um, scent connection there. Um, so I, I don't know about that. So I, it, I know that you don't know a lot about surefoot, but one of my questions is that what I notice with surefoot is that horses can change what appear to be habits very quickly. So are habits in horses wired the same way as habits in people? Yes, but it really depends on what kind of a habit we're talking about. So what you're talking about is not just a habit, it is an innate wiring. Horses are hardwired between their feet and their brains. So this is not just a learned habit. You're talking about something that is actually 
um, there's, there are actual peripheral nerves that lead from the horse's foot up the leg to the shoulder to the spinal cord. And then the spinal cord takes that information onto the horse's brain. And that kind of wiring um, can alter the way that the horse is going to move or the, um, the way that he distributes or shifts his weight around in his body to a quicker, uh, at a quicker degree than it is going to be to change a learned habit that is not hardwired. Yeah, because what I, I sometimes talk about it as resetting the horse. In other words, that some things come in and alter their movement and somehow Surefoot removes the alteration, if you will. Yes, yes. And so um, I, I think that, I think the reason that works is because of the hardwiring. It would probably also work if it was a learned habit, but it would take a lot more time and it would take explicit training to change a learned habit. And I think what you're talking about is not a training thing. It's something that the horse is doing kind of automatically with the mechanics of the way his body works. Yeah, no, that that really, um, that helps a lot because I have seen horses where they need to see Surefoot for over a course of years to change patterns. One horse in particular who had broken his ribs probably when he was a foal and then went to a bad trainer and had terrible anxiety. Uh -huh. he, he was kind of the exception where I've had other horses literally touch the pad and change. I mean, it's scary right. fast. Right, right. So maybe we'll have to send you some pads so you can play with them and kind of see see what you come up with. I would play with them. It would be fun to play with them. Um, I have had farriers who use them in the past, but I have never, um, you know, used them myself for any other purpose. So it would, it would be fun to do that. Yeah, it would um, because I'd love to I, get your take on it. <laughs> yeah, I just glanced down at the chat icon on my screen here and it says that we have 45 messages, which I'm happy to answer and hear. I'm actually really curious. So let's go ahead with those. Well, we've been actually running through quite a bit of them. Uh, okay. Some of them are just comments and I've kind of been keeping you up to date, but there's one here that's, my mayor likes to stand on the other side of the surefoot pad, uh, hang on, on the right side, she tends to rest only her heel, but on the wrong side, she leans her whole way. There is no wrong side. <laughs> You can use either side of the pads, but it's interesting that she has a preference. Um, so somebody's asking, any idea on breaking learned habits such as pawing? Well, the question is, That's, yeah. There's a, there's a pawing is one of the most difficult habits to break. There are ways to break it. And there's, um, I think there are two sections in my book that talk explicitly about how to uh, untrain pawing behavior. Um, you can do it with counter conditioning. Uh, for one, well, that's one way of doing it. And another way you can do it is just with standard conditioning. An awful lot of times people are unaware of just how much they are rewarding their horses for pawing. And so even if you just stop the rewards, that can help. Um, and then um, in some more stubborn cases, that alone is not enough to break the habit of pawing. Uh, when that happens, then we use a technique called counter conditioning. And I have some really specific examples in my book of exactly what you can do to do that. I've broken in a lot of horses of pawing. Pawing is one of the things that, I'm sorry, I just don't put up with that. <laughs> so. But I think I think you've hit on something that that is really important to emphasize in that so often we don't realize that we are actually reinforcing a behavior by our actions and then we're upset that the action continues but we have kept it going <laughs> yes yes we're basically rewarding the horse for doing something that we don't want him to do right and even if it's and a negative it's, reward right and you're absolutely right it happens really really commonly and often and nobody should feel bad about it it's you know part of our natural brain process but if you really learn more about it and um some of the chapters in my book on um on keep on learning on how horses learn get into that very very specifically so i think they would be helpful um Hang on, I just have to answer this question about pads. Uh, I, I can put up a post. 
both sides. So I can just put up a post on Facebook about using both sides of the pads because the, the slants, you don't use both sides, but the firm, medium, and soft and hard, you can use on both sides and the physio pad. Um, but we'll just make sure we put up a post so that we help people understand that. So um, so yeah, I think that this this is so interesting. I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> um, I, love, I love to hear people's comments. I, I must say, I get the most fascinating questions and comments from people uh, you know on my email on my website on facebook and i love them it's really fun to consider some of these things and you know i mean some questions are things that i can answer well and quickly other questions are things that um, are going to require more research but it really helps me to know what kinds of things people are interested in what is it that everybody wants to know and needs to know yeah. So, so let me ask you this. Um, what is the most sort of interesting or unusual thing that you discovered about the brain that people were misunderstanding? This is, my answer is going to be something that's very different, I think, from what you expect. It's okay. But the most fascinating thing I have discovered is that human brains actively prevent us from understanding other animals' brains. Wow, that's actually really deep. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. And, and when you really get into it, you realize, wow, our brains are actually, you know, blocking us to a degree from understanding this. And I think that's why I have to emphasize so much to people that, um, your horse's brain is extremely different from your own. He doesn't experience the world the way you do. And if you can learn more about how he does experience the world, it will help you and your horse a lot. That's awesome. Well, Jenna, I wanna thank you so much for joining me today. This is so fascinating and um, you know, it's such a great topic and I'm so glad you're doing this work and that you have this book out and um, and it sounds like you're continuing to do more research and study and figure oh, yes. out. So um, that's really exciting because the more we can understand our horses from our horses perspective, the, the better off we are at being successful, the better chance we have. Yeah, so. I think so too. Well, thank you so much, Wendy, for inviting me. I love doing this and I just encourage everybody Go have a look at the website. And if you do have more questions, feel free to contact me and I'll, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much. And thanks everybody for joining us. Just remember, you can find this and all the other webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. If you subscribe, you'll get a notice every time we put up the next webinar. And um, tomorrow we're going to have Sharon Wilsey. Oh, do you know of Sharon Wilsey? Well, I have not met her in person and I'm anxious to do that. You know, because th this book was released during the worst part of the pandemic. Uh, every bookstore in the world was closed <laughs> when this book came out. And so none of us really knew what to expect. And it meant, of course, that all of the conferences and conventions and expositions got canceled. So I have not been able to meet her or, or many other people, but I'm anxious to do that. Yeah, because I uh, somebody had said that in the chat. It'd be really fascinating to get you two together. Uh, maybe one time we'll do a webinar together. We'll have the three of four of us because Sharon and Laura come together. Um, that might be really interesting to have a that discussion. Could be, that could be interesting. Definitely. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, I'll keep okay. that in mind and maybe we'll be in touch to bring you back again. Okay. Thank you so much, Wendy. And thanks to all of the viewers out there. I really appreciate your time today. Great. Everybody have a great time. We'll see you. The time tomorrow is 10 o'clock for Sharon and Laura. It's different than our normal time because I'm traveling, but we'll see you all tomorrow. And thanks again, Janet. Have a fabulous day. Okay. Bye. Bye.